So let's move on to the next presentation, um, which will be uh, on Pi Palsec, um, given by uh, Kerti Ravan Ravi from the Col uh, Columbia University in New York. Um, so uh, Sravan, the, uh, the stage is yours. Could you start sharing? It should work. Perfect. Hi. Hi, Matthias. Is my screen visible now? Yes. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody from wherever you're joining us. Uh, welcome to my talk on sequence programming with Bible C. Um, so let's get started. I have nothing to disclose. So first I'd like to talk about the world of Pulse Sequence development before Pulse Seek and after Pulse Seek. Um, before Pulse Seek, Pulse Sequence development was not exactly user-friendly in the sense that it had a high entry barrier because this required developers to learn low-level or vendor-specific programming languages. And this was also a barrier for multi-site, multi-vendor studies. And the previous efforts at tackling this problem were um, could not entirely facilitate rapid development. Uh, because they required hundreds of lines of source code or extensive configurations, or uh, maybe they supported only one vendor. So um, with these kind of issues, then in uh, 2017, PulseSeq was introduced, um, which was a MATLAB-based open source framework for Pulse Sequence development. And as we know, MATLAB is a popular programming platform. And the way PulseSeq worked was you could design Pulse Sequences and export them um, into the .seq file format, which is vendor independent, low level and human readable. So by vendor independent, it makes it, um, it allows it broad compatibility. Um, it is low level for maximum flexibility and simpler hardware implementation. And it's human readable for easier debugging. And these were the hardwares that um, PulseSeq supports. So we have GE via the Toppy framework, there's Siemens, Broker, um, and then on the open source side, there is Okra and Flokra. And in this way, Pulse Sequence development started becoming more accessible because now researchers only need to be familiar with one um, programming environment. Now we wanted to figure out a way around the licensing costs associated with MATLAB and Python seemed to be an obvious choice. Um, as of 2021, it is the third most popular programming language as per Stack Overflow's 2021 developer survey. And it has a vast library of open source packages. So to get started with for MR simulation, there's GPI lab open source software, which enables users to visually assemble algorithms in a scientific integrated development environment. And in the MR image reconstruction bucket, there is a Python implementation of the ISMR MRD uh, data format. There's PI on year 50 for fast non-uniform Fourier transform with GPU support. There, um, there's also Twix tools for reading Siemens.dat files, for example. And then when we talk about MR image visualization and processing, there is NumPy for all the basic numerical processing. There's matplotlib for image visualization. There is OpenCV for image processing. Um, and then in the deep learning bucket, there's uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, Scikit-learn, and many other libraries out there. I'd like to point out that this is not an exhaustive list of libraries because there are just too many. So finally, we realized that the MR acquisition block was lacking um, in the world of Python. And what excited us was this realization that bridging this gap would, would enable GPI to encompass the entire MR workflow on a single platform. This is because GPI anyway supports performing these tasks in its own way. So that brings us to PulseSeq GPI, which translated PulseSeq into Python and leveraged GPI's um, graphic elements to develop PulseSeq sequences. So as we can see in the figure on the right, um, blocks, events, and shapes from PulseSeq were mapped to nodes, widgets, and widget configurations in GPI. And in this way, the users could develop uh, Pulse sequences. So GPI has a library of nodes, and this now enabled the entire MR pipeline of simulation, acquisition, reconstruction, and image visualization to exist on a single platform. 
So as we went along, we renamed PulseSeq GPI as PyPulseSeq and focused more heavily on the Python programming aspect of Pulse Sequence development. We published it on the Python packages repository, um, and now it can be installed via a single command. All a user needs to do on their Python interpreter is just go ahead and type pip install PyPulseSeq, -E, and that's all it takes to get started with uh, PyPulseSeq. Um, and then further along the path of making Pulse Sequence development uh, more accessible, we arrive at this combination of PyPulseSeq um, and Colab, which um, uh, then lets me say for PyPulseSeq, all you need is a browser. So Google Colab is a free tool that lets you run Python in a browser, and it enables zero footprint usage of PyPulseSeq. It jumpstarts a user's Pulse Sequence development journey by letting them upload a notebook. Um, or import a notebook from Google Drive or GitHub. So now I'm excited to perform a quick demonstration of coding up a 2D GRE sequence in Google Colab using PyPal Seek. Uh, you can please follow along at the URL on the slide, which is uh, www.tinyurl.com slash ESMRMB2021. So I'll just wait a couple of seconds for the attendees to catch the URL before switching over to the browser. So that's tinyurl.com slash ESMRMB2021. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so I have the tab open here um, and it's an empty notebook. I have the uh, code required in another notebook. I'm just in the interest of time, I'm gonna get started with um, installing the PyPulseq library. So like I mentioned, all it takes is a single command. We need to just go ahead with pip install PyPulseq and that should take a couple of seconds. And I think the exciting thing about working with Google Colab um, as any attendee familiar with uh, Jupyter Notebooks would know, is that it lets us combine um, rich text and other media along with code. So this makes it really um, a conducive environment to create uh, rich tutorials uh, and good user documentation for sequences. Okay, so it looks like we have the PulseSeq, uh, PyPulseq library installed. So I'm just going to confirm that it was installed as expected by running import PyPLC. So we see a green check mark there that uh, that's like our green light. So now we go ahead and import the packages that we need. Uh, NumPy for processing, matplotlib for visualization. And then we have the setup where we define a field of view and flip angle and other variables. And we assign these system limits. Next, um, we have the events block. So this is where we create the RF pulses, the gradients, the delays, and so on. And now we put all of these together by looping over them in a for loop to make the sequence object. And now we visualize one TR of uh, the waveform for one TR's worth, just to see that everything is as expected. And the really exciting bit for me is to be able to download the seek file that now I can share with uh, my peers and colleagues and which they can import into their notebook and make modifications or take it to their hardware and uh, execute. So I just downloaded the seek file. It says um, esmrmbdemo.seek. So now I'm going to bring this up in I'm going to open up the seek file so that we can take a look at it and understand what um, it looks like. Right, so here we have the seek file and we start with some header information at the top. And when I said it was human readable, we can see it's in completely textual format. Um, this is a mapping of the blocks and then it links to RF events, gradient events, 
ADC events and delays. So all of these blocks basically correspond to how the pulse sequence plays out. Um, further down, um, we can just a second. We can take a look at what the RF events look like and what the delays look like. For example, so ADC delays, uh, ADC events, we can look take a look at the dwell, the delay, the frequency, the phase, for example. And we similarly have the RF events and so on. Okay, so let's get back to the presentation. This was exciting. Um, so now what I will do is list a few of the applications that leverage Piper C. Um, I will start with autonomous MRI, which leverages Piper C to perform intelligent slice planning and to satisfy a user's imposed acquisition time constraint. Then we have pulse diffusion for diffusion weighted imaging sequences. We have a spiral fMRI for the presto contrast with the high temporal resolution. We have seek to prospa which uh, translates sequences uh, to the Magritex PR2 spectrometer um, and therefore enables low field imaging. We have the Pi to Gemris uh, tool, which converts seek files into Gemris compatible file formats for block simulation. We have Pipal Seek Cest to construct Cest blocks. Um, Pipal Seek SigPy, uh, which leverages SigPy.mri, which is a third party open source Python library. And this tool lets you deploy simultaneous multi slice select um, RF pulses. And then there's an implementation of minimal TE sequences such as 2D and 3D UT and concurrent dephasing and excitation. Now I will in particular talk about uh, the virtual scanner 2.0 project, which is a web-based hybrid simulator console for MR research and education with simulation, reconstruction and analysis modules. Um, <clears throat> it is a zero footprint modular and um, supported by open source standards. So it's UI mimics a scanner console UI and it brings the user first to a login page. Once past that, they're presented with a numerical phantom, uh, which mimics the registration page. Um, and post subject registration, the web app lets the user set up an MR exam uh, based on a list of sequences available and lets you modify the acquisition parameters. And once the simulation is completed, uh, the user can perform uh, image analysis tasks such as T1 mapping, for example. And as a part of this project, there are also notebooks published, uh, which simulate RF pulses, B0, B1 maps, and uh, demonstrate the entire end-to-end -end pipeline that I was just mentioning. So while it is exciting to help democratize pulse sequence development, we understand the risks and challenges uh, that come with it. So first and foremost is safety. Um, and thankfully, PyPulseq has a built-in SAR package to compute RF safety metrics. Um, next is this framework for validating and sharing open source sequences. Um, it outlines responsibilities for sequence developers and users to give feedback, and therefore it encourages collaborative sequence development and strengthens repeatability. So in conclusion, PyPulseq enjoys the benefit of running in a browser, thanks to Google Colab. So users can take advantage of Google's free powerful cloud hardware. Um, compatibility with multiple vendors, integration with a vast library of third-party open source packages, enabling advanced functionalities, and the ability to educate new users about pulse sequence development via rich documentation and interactive tutorials. And with that, I'd like to conclude my talk. I'd like to thank my mentors and peers at Columbia and the GitHub community at large for constantly pushing me to work on the project and identifying bugs and reporting the bugs. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me at uh, my email and please get started at github.com slash IMR hyphen framework slash Piper C. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Stavan, for uh, um, this impressive presentation. Um, there really seems to be a, a lot of going on with um, with the PyPal tech and, and on different uh, levels. So uh, that's quite exciting to see. Um, I was wondering about uh, um, real-time updates, uh, like motion compensation, uh, stuff like this. 
Uh, is this something you are um, planning to integrate or maybe it's already integrated um, and, and how would this look like? Uh, thanks, Matthias. That's a great question. So I think um, Maxim and I do have uh, discussions sometimes regarding this, um, and we do plan to integrate this uh, mostly. So the way it works is PyPulseq uh, will leverage the interpreter that the PulseQ team develops. So um, we will definitely be working on that in the near future. Excellent. And um, uh, if it comes to the inclusion of, uh, of other scanner vendors or um, or platforms um, uh, you do you rely on on community efforts um, to to actually um, uh, build the the drivers for for each system or um, what is the 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 typical approach uh, that's a great question so so far with uh, GE wire toppy I think that has been uh, primarily John's effort so if there is a new vendor and we are interested in supporting that, um, I think it would depend on if we are able to have access to it at our site. Um, and then if we do, I think it could be like an internal effort. Um, for hardware that we do not have access to, I think we would rely on the community to uh, give us a boost. Mm. Yeah, so we, we have to motivate the community to <laughs> develop yes. the drivers. <laughs> to really uh, bring it to all the systems. Uh, great, thank you. Um, yeah, there, uh, there was um, one comment congratulating on, on bringing this on, on Collab. Uh, so that's really great to, to have this uh, zero footprint usage. Yeah, I, I think definitely, I think it makes it portable um, in a way that is difficult to imagine on other platforms. So yeah. I think it's a unique intersection of what uh, that the Google uh, Collab tool can offer and Python's portability. So I think it makes it work. Yeah. Thank you again for uh, uh, giving the presentation. Um, I guess you will be around for, for further questions. Uh, yes, also definitely. Yes. And, uh, so great. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, Matthias. Thanks.